This day is a very special day because I don't know if many of you realize this or not, but back on July 21st, 1978, that's right, July 21st, 1978, well, let me back up. On July 18th, Garner Ted Armstrong, his wife Shirley, and brother-in-law Guy Carnes, who was married to Mrs. Armstrong's sister, Jackie, proceeded to go to the uh, state of Texas and sit down and sign all the document papers of the Church of God International to where they formally submitted their incorporation as a nonprofit organization registered with the federal government of the United States. On July 21st, 1978, the Church of God International was formally recognized as a nonprofit organization uh, in the, here in the United States, got our own federal ID number and all of that. And so what I'm saying is it is the birthday. It is the birthday of the Church of God International. This year marks 40 years, 40 years that the Church of God International has been existing as a separate entity outside of, of course, of where Garner Ted Armstrong came out of, which uh, some of us have also roots in the worldwide Church of God. As a matter of fact, in 19. 84, after 13 years of being in the Worldwide Church of God, my wife and I, Margie, left the Worldwide Church of God and uh, commenced uh, association with and fellowship with the Church of God International in 1984, starting with a small group over there in Bath, Ohio. And frankly, the congregation here in Medina had been called the Bath Congregation for many, many years. We were at the Bath Town Hall for 20 years there, renting $5 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't beat the price, <laughs> but uh, certainly was hard to justify the fact of buying any kind of uh, property at that time with you only looking at $5 an hour for your cost to rent the space. But be that as it may, uh, we were there for 20 years until they finally kicked us out because they converted the Grange building, which was the Bath Town Hall, into a museum. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result today, as a matter of fact, it still is a museum. But um, we do have a chance, of course, here, as many of us know, to possibly uh, settle down and to essentially uh, find some roots here in this building if indeed our loan is approved. And uh, again, let me just remind all of you, and if I could implore those of you on the Internet as well, to pray that God's will will be done in this and that uh, it will be favored with the approval because it would be nice to be able to uh, not have to set up, huh? How about that? Not have to set up chairs, not have to tear down chairs or wonder where we're going to meet next Sabbath and uh, cart all the stuff in and out of uh, places that so many of the congregations do have to do, and uh, my hat's off to all of us who do that uh, Sabbath after Sabbath. But that brings us full circle as well here in the Medina now, formerly the Bath Congregation, of celebrating 34 years, 34 years of actually having a congregation here that started out with, as I mentioned, about 18 people in Bath, and then uh, proceeded from that point on to uh, continue to uh, grow and increase uh, over the years. And it's been uh, quite, a, quite a journey, as they would say, in, in looking at it over the years. And I couldn't help but to stop and think a little bit about all of the things and experiences that have gone on over the last 34 years since uh, leaving the Worldwide Church of God. But even in the Worldwide Church of God, too, the memories that go back to the 70s and playing baseball and uh, the many uh, functions that uh, were organized, as was here even in the Church of God International going back in those 34 years as we uh, went ahead and learned uh, about each other, developing relationships, the memories, oh boy, the memories of uh, so many people and so many things that have gone on, uh, as I say, over the years. People that I even, in, when I owned my business, hired uh, so that they could uh, make a little money on the side and uh, help me install my water treatment systems uh, all over the area and uh, do electrical work and plumbing work and even some welding and modifying my service trucks and vans. Uh, quite, a, quite an ordeal that we've had and quite a lot of stories that I could probably share with many of you up here and spend hours just kind of reminiscing and maybe even some of you going back and forth reminiscing about some of the memories uh, that all of you have over the years of the things that we've done from uh, time to time. And all of the people, all of the people that have come and gone. And let me just take a moment, indulge uh, your attention uh, 
on some of this because as I was going through the people that I've buried, yep, that's right, I've kept a list of every funeral I've done since I've been in the Church of God International when my funeral services started. <laughs> and um, I can't imagine, I just, I, I was looking at some of the names, some of the names I forgot. And as I was going down through the list, I was reminded of those people. And I took some time to remember their faces. People like Bill Shelton and Roy Brown, Linus Ferguson, Bella McCandless, even my own mother-in-law, Teresa, Teresa Hales. And the stories associated with that, I remember this one story of uh, Roy Brown coming to my house. I didn't even know Roy knew where I lived. He came to my house about 11 o'clock at night, knocking on my door. 11 o'clock at night, and I didn't even think this guy knew where I lived. And he was a member. I mean, we were already going for about two or three years. We started, you know, developing relationships with each other, and all of a sudden, Roy turns up at my doorstep at about 11 o'clock at night. He op I open up the door. I said, Roy. He says, Bill, I have an emergency. I said, what? He said, open the door. Let me in. I opened up the door, and here comes the congregation into the house, a surprise birthday party at my house at about 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. But these are some of the stories, and now Roy, many of you know, he was kind of a comical character, about six foot four, uh, really uh, quite an easy guy to get along with, uh, a graduate from Bob Jones University, and was quite, uh, quite the fella, and married some of you. Married some, married some of you right here in this room. Uh, uh, the Kelly and Frank Walter, uh, Michelle and Darren, and Jessica and Chuck, and, and uh, Dave Rosinko and his, his uh, son, and Terry. Uh, individuals that uh, I've, I've married that are still, still married. Some of them, though, looking back, and I went down through the names because I kept everybody's name, are no longer married. <laughs> sometimes they stuck, and sometimes they didn't. But the fact of it is, there are a lot of memories to, to think of, a lot of uh, good stories, good times, funny times uh, in so many ways. But the point of all this that I'm trying to make and setting myself up here to talk about what I really want to talk about today is that a lot of these memories, a lot of these stories, the good times and the bad times, the funny times, and in some cases, hilarious times. Uh, the, Bill Shelton's boat down on the Ohio River, you know, water skiing with, uh, uh, I forget his name now, um, oh, I forget his name, but at any rate, uh, it was on the, on the Ohio River, you know, running the risk uh, of uh, possibly uh, running into logs. And Ralph uh, Bookman, of course, uh, teaching some of the youngsters on how to sail on, out, out there on Atwood Lake uh, years ago when uh, Ralph was with us uh, doing those kinds of things. So many stories. But again, as I, as I point out here, my, my point is, is that congregations, church congregations are very, very beneficial if, and this is the operative, this is the operative, they become enriching experiences. They become support mechanisms. They become compelling forces in the life of a Christian, motivating forces in the life of a Christian if, this is the operative, if we take the time to build relationships with each other. That's critical. It really is critical. And obviously that brings you to a question, or at least it, it would for me anyway, is, okay, Bill, if I am going to have an enriched experience by fellowshipping in a congregation, and you're saying that what's key to that enrichment, what underscores the experience of and being able to obtain and or acquire that enrichment is to build relationships, the question is, What is fundamental to that? What is foundational to that? And then later on as secondary, how do I get that done? Well, let me bring your attention over here first to Matthew chapter 22, because this is fundamental. This is foundational in building relationships with each other. And it's important that we get our minds around this and grasp it 
and let it resonate and, and become real to us in, in, a, in a fashion that will indeed be compelling for all of us so that we can use it as the motivating stick that it should be. Over here, Jesus is asked by a lawyer in verse 35 of Matthew 22. He's asked by this lawyer, and the lawyer had an attitude. He was tempting him. He, this, he had an agenda. He's working, trying to get, uh, you know, Jesus in a gotcha moment. So he's purposely attempting to set him up. And so he says here, uh, Master, verse 36, which is the great commandment in the law? So he pits this question to Jesus, fishing for how Jesus is going to answer this. And Jesus goes right to the Old Testament. A lot of people think, well, he quote, this is a new law. This is, this is New Testament stuff. No, it's not. He went right to the book of Deuteronomy. He went right to the book of Leviticus. Because why did he do that? Because the Old Testament was the Bible of the early New Testament church. And that's why, again, let me always remind us that the Old Testament is very relevant. It's very cogent. It's very contemporary to the 21st century Christian. And so here Jesus says, no problem here. Basically, 37, he immediately launches into answering this guy. And he goes right to Deuteronomy. And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then he says, secondly, or and the second, is like unto it. And then he goes to Leviticus, chapter 19 specifically, and says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's right, that's in the Old Testament. It's not a New Testament statement. He didn't invent this. He's quoting the Old Testament Torah. And he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then summarizes on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. And so he puts a, a period there, exclamation mark, and essentially establishes the answer that the lawyer attempted to get him in a gotcha moment. Over here to Matthew chapter 19, along these same line here, he, Jesus, again is approached, in this case, um, by a, a different individual. And uh, in verse 16 of chapter 19, book of Matthew, we read a similar situation where he says, Behold, uh, one comes and says unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said, Well, why are you calling me good? There's only uh, uh, none good but one, and that is God. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said, You shall do no murder. And he goes and proceeds, of all things, to start quoting the Ten Commandments right out of Exodus 20, Again, out of Deuteronomy, out of Leviticus, he's, he's right out of the Torah. Jesus goes right to Scripture, which the only Scriptures at the time that existed were the Old Testament, the Torah, the law, the, which is the law, of course, and the writings and the prophets. He says, honor your father, in verse 19, your mother, and then summarizes it by just stating simply, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So th these are important this is an important element, fundamental, to the, to the relationship building process that all of us as Christians uh, certainly are faced with. But admittedly, and I think all of you would agree, it's hard. It's hard to love other people outside of ourselves as much as we love ourselves. And why is that? Because it goes against our nature. Our nature is basically selfish. We're self-centered. We're self-oriented. So to exercise one's concerns for others on the same level, the same moral equivalence of how you care for yourself is not the easiest thing to do. It's not easy at all. As a matter of fact, it's quite hard to get one to take some time, maybe to investigate some of the addresses that we didn't give, but perhaps uh, we'll be able to find out as we go along here on some of these families that are mourning due to the surprising loss of a mother or a father in the case of the individual up in Canada. And then 
take out a pen and a paper, drive in your car and go to a pharmacy or a drugstore and get a card and write something encouraging after you get their address and mailing it and taking the time to do that and spending the money for the card and whatever else that may be associated, that's difficult. Believe it or not, it's difficult for some of us to find the time to do that or to have the courage to pick up the telephone and call a total stranger out of the blue and just say, you know what, I'm so-and-so, I live in such-and-such, and I'm in the church too, and because you've got that connection of God's Holy Spirit, guess what? Your brothers and sisters, your brothers and sisters, they're not going to hang up on you. They're going to listen to what you have to say and take opportunity to go ahead and encourage them and take that opportunity to reach out and attempt to try to make a connection. Oftentimes we think, well, that's what the minister should do. Well, you know what? That's what we do. <laughs> we do do that. But, but as, as we often try to explain and attempt to try to persuade and encourage, we as members, brethren, the culture of the Church of God International is dedicated and devoted to, de to encouraging you to develop these characteristics that are so very, very important in your Christian life as you learn how to express Christian attributes, to get out from underneath ourselves, from out from underneath our, our desires and the time that we spend and go out and visit somebody in a hospital. Well, the minister, you know, that's, that's what the minister does. He visits people in the hospital. Uh, he, he visits the, uh, the widows in their plight. Uh, he, he does those things. You know, let, it, let him do it. That's what he wants to do. Let him do it, you know. But no, 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 no. Brethren, that's what we all need to be doing. We all need to be showing these particular attributes and taking these times to uh, certainly pray for one another without a doubt, because that's what we're trying to invoke and appeal for, at least in that respect, from the lectern every week as we come to understand people who have needs in areas of health or well-being or in other areas of, of anything along those lines. But being concerned is one thing, but here's again another operative, showing it. You know, you, you can be concerned. Oh, boy, that is terrible. I'm sorry to hear about that particular thing. Oh, that's so devastating. I can just imagine what they're going through. Oh, it just breaks my heart to hear. And we hear a lot of commentary like that. And perhaps even you and or myself from time to time have found ourselves falling into that particular mode of thinking. But here's the distinction that makes, makes it really different that defines one who is actually involved, proactively involved, in the conversion process. And that is if they're compelled to do something as a result of that concern that they have. If the concern that you have compels you to do something, that is very important in validating your Christianity and the conversion that you're supposed to be involved with. And the Bible, brethren, is loaded with that lesson. Over here in Ephesians chapter 4, as an example here. Chapter 4 and in verse 17 we read this. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. And the implication here is that you don't occupy yourself. You don't take up your time in your mind by being preoccupied with as the Gentiles would occupy themselves in the vanity of their mind. And the vanity of their mind is their own selfishness, their own self-orientation. They're hung up on themselves about what they can do, about what their lives are all about and how they can enhance it and so on. And not that that's wrong. Don't get me uh, out of context here because Certainly, there is a balance that I'm appealing for for all of us because we've got to take care of ourselves, of course. And it, it's implicit that we do care for ourselves and that we take care of ourselves, our health and our safety, our clothing, our shelter, all these survival needs that we have, our food needs and so on, that we as human beings need to have met 
in order for us to be able to do other things and hopefully then be able to parlay some of that energy into doing things for others, especially especially if indeed we've been blessed in ways that others perhaps less fortunate have not been that afford us to meet certain needs from one another. And you see, brethren, that's what community is all about. That's what community is all about, being able to look out amongst ourselves and seeing certain needs and attempting to try to fill those needs when in fact we have the resources to do so, if indeed we do. Verse 18, verse 18, chapter 4, book of Ephesians, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. This is what Paul is saying that we should not be doing because those are the things that cause the Gentiles uh, and the, or the unconverted mind. We can talk about it spiritual Gentiles being connotative of those that are unconverted and involved still in serving themselves. Uh, selfishly. Verse 19, he continues, who being past feeling, having given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, and that is fraud and selfishness, that's what that Greek word means, but you have not learned Christ. So verses 17 through about 19 is all of what we should not be allowing ourselves to do, and Paul uh, makes that very clear in verse 20, where he states, you have not learned Christ. Now he goes on and shifts and says in verse 21, if so be, you got to be, he wants you to be this way. I, I put a little quotations on be, underlined it. Be, because that's invoking action. If so be, that you have heard him. In other words, don't just say you've heard about him. Don't just say you believe in Jesus. Don't just say, yeah, I believe in the truth. Don't just say, oh, yeah, I'm so blessed. I understand certain things that are, that are key in knowing what the truth of the Bible really is all about. No, 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 no. Don't just think about that. He says here, you be uh, that you have learned him or heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And the truth in Jesus is, what is the truth about Jesus? He manifested goodness. That's the truth about Jesus. The truth about Christ in you, Christ crucified, the things we learn through Passover. What is the truth about Christ? It's the manifestation of goodness in Him doing goodwill to others, even to the point ultimately of sacrificing His own life for all of us. That's what's key in knowing and understanding what this is uh, referring to when he says, as the truth is in Jesus. Verse 22 now, he gets more specific. Chapter 4, book of Ephesians, that you put off concerning the former conduct, the former conversation. You change, you convert, you leave, you're putting off, you're discarding, you're undressing, unpacking that from you the former conduct, don't be the way you were. It's got to be different now. You're obligated. That's what you did. That's part of the contract that you agreed to when you went under the waters of baptism. Repentance. What does repentance mean? Just being sorry for your sins? Yeah, that's part of it. But there's another part of it. The other part of it is a commitment to change. Repentance is a commitment to change. That's what you've got to do, a commitment to change. When you go under the waters of baptism, you come up out of those waters. You have been now washed clean of all the former stuff. That's the figured, uh, figurative um, picture that you've got here. That's the metaphor that's going on. And like a spoon in the temple that was dipped in the water, cleaned for the sacrificial system, you as an object of the spiritual temple has gone into the bowl of water and you have come up and have had hands laid on you, and you've been filled with oil in your bowl, if I can use that term, and your bowl being, of course, you as a person, your body, figuratively speaking, spiritually speaking, in the symbology of what all that means. And consequently, it comes with expectations of change. Verse 22, let me reiterate, you, that you put off concerning the former conduct, that old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lusts, and be, look at this, renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on, you put off the other stuff, now you're going to put on a new man, 
which after God is, uh, in this case, uh, created in righteousness and true holiness. What's that all about? That is about doing goodness. That's what that's about. It is about focusing on doing good things for others as well as yourself. Verse 25, now he's going to get real specific. Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Don't be angry, or uh, be you angry. He says, be you angry, but don't sin. Sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What's that all about? Don't hold grudges. Don't hold grudges. Let it go. If somebody says they're sorry, let it go. Certainly. And or if there's nothing you can do about it, well, don't hold it against them forever and ever. That's just going to ruin the relationship. It's going to ruin the relationship and somehow uh, it's going to limit, at best, the relationship, if not, as I say, at worst, ruin it. Be very careful about letting the sun go down upon your wrath in the extended meaning of that. Verse 27, neither give place to the devil. And of course, what does the devil do? The devil focuses on divide and conquer. Grudge holding, bitterness is the typical tool, crowbar, that Satan uses to wedge in between you and and me, figuratively speaking. I'm just saying, between all of us. If I can get anybody to hold a grudge or get bitter toward another, that's, that's the beginning of the proverbial camel's nose under the tent. And before you know it, if I can keep working that bitterness, I can keep working that uh, uh, grudge that is being held, before you know it, as they say, the whole camel's body is in the tent, figuratively speaking. So he's saying here, be careful on that because that is indeed the play, giving place for the devil. Verse 28 now, chapter 4, book of Ephesians. Let him that stole steal no more. That's pretty clear. Rather, let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needs. What, what's that? That's about, you know, the more you make and the more you earn and the more you acquire, you're expected to share. It's not about the government dispersing everything. It's about us making decisions out of our own free will, out of charity, agape, the Greek word being affectionate love, and giving as we see others' needs manifest before us. And that is what it's being said here. You don't just work so that you can have 10 steaks. I mean, you can only eat one steak at a time, right? <laughs> so maybe give, give at least five of the, the 10 away. You know, Keep five for yourself. But the bottom line is, is that you need to keep in mind that you're working to share those goods with others in, uh, in addition. Let no corrupt communication or worthless, worthless communication uh, proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good or building to the use of edifying, that is educating, that it may minister, and what that is, is grace or joy unto the hearers. So if what you're saying is nothing more than depressing people, and you're wondering why you don't have friends, you need to wake up and smell the coffee and maybe change what you say and how you say it. We used to have a saying in Spokesman's Club, if you want friends, show yourself friendly. That's a proverb. You've got to show yourself friendly first. You know, people come into the church sometimes, and in light of the fact that, uh, you know, this does indeed happen occasionally where they walk in, they sit down, they're visitors or whatever, and then they, nobody says anything to them. They get up and leave them and say, boy, that church is not friendly. Well, did they try to get to know the people too. I mean, it's also part of their responsibility in addition that if they do come in and visit that, you know, they reach out and say, hey, my name is Bill Watson. Who are you? You know, yeah, I'm in from town. You know, I'm just traveling through or whatever. I'm on a business trip or what have you and uh, get to know some of the people and walk around, mix and mingle or meet and greet, as we would often say, uh, individuals. And for those of us who do visit uh, other congregations, we should take opportunity to be that kind of a friendly, outgoing uh, type so that we can maybe, who knows, uh, develop some new relationships along the way. He goes on here, Paul does, in verse 30, 
And he states, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are uh, sealed unto the day of redemption. And that grieving is all, um, often, uh, or can be, I should say, uh, translated as sorry as well. Don't, don't sorry the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness, and there's that word, bitterness and wrath, anger and clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice, and malice is badness, you know, wanting the worst for things to turn out. Ah, I hope that fails. You know, ah, I don't like that. Oh, boy, I, that person, I wish something would happen. Maybe, you know, stop, break, maybe break a leg or something, trip on a stick or whatever, you know, fall in a ditch. Uh, that person is just worthless, you know. And there's people that think that way. Oh, yeah. They can't stand to see other people succeed. They get jealous. They get envious. We shouldn't be that way, brethren. We shouldn't be that way. We should be very, uh, very encouraging the cheerleaders of each other. We see somebody uh, making some successes or having some successes. Hey, we ought to be, you know, go, 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 girl. You know, go, 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 guy. Uh, and do what you're doing because it's working. And, uh, you know, the more you make, hopefully, the more you'll give. And uh, it's not all, always about tithes and offerings. What I'm saying is more you'll give to others as well as you see the needs of those that are among, among you and around you. And then verse 32, he comes back full circle and he says, And be you kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And that's the barometer. Because if you're unforgiving and you're holding grudges and you're going to be bitter and non-tender and uh, unforgiving and all of that, well, the barometer is, remember, your forgiveness is relative to what God is doing for you. And if you're not going to be forgiving, how can you expect God to forgive you? That's the barometer. And that, that's very clear in the Bible as well. This very theme, I'm not going to take the time to go through uh, James chapter 2, 14 through 26, the end of the chapter. But do take the time to read James 2, 14 to the end of the chapter because it goes along these same lines and substantiates this very theme we just went through here in Ephesians chapter 4 where it supports again the fact that we need to be doers, not just hearers. We need to get out there and actively and progressively participate in this opportunity because congregations, brethren, provide us with opportunity to serve and to lead. And what I mean by that is not always is it perhaps leading a committee or leading some kind of a group within the congregation. It's leading yourself. It's taking opportunity to take the lead yourself and go and do something for someone else or something for your mate or something for your children or something for your grandchildren and making life fun by spreading whatever wealth you might have or whatever time you might have. Maybe it's not even money. And I don't want to get so focused that that's all we're thinking about is money because time is also very valuable. If you have time to share with others who perhaps are not as well outfitted to maybe take care of something or gifted in certain areas to do certain things around a house or who knows, or repair a car or what have you, and you've got those gifts, those talents where you know and you've got the time, hey, it doesn't cost you anything but maybe some time and some little gas to drive over to their house and help them out in doing whatever you're, uh, they, they have a need for. But these are the things that we need to keep in mind because they all are opportunities to give us chances to build relationships through the experiences, through the experiences that we go through with one another. When I go back, as I was mentioning before in the opening, and remember all the experiences I had with some of the names that I mentioned, and the stories that come flooding into my mind about the, uh, events that I shared with those individuals here and there and hither and yon, uh, how, did, how did all that happen? Why do I have those memories? I have them because I had relationships with those people. I spent time with them in many areas, uh, doing things together uh, in the church and, and uh, projects that uh, we shared in time and, and uh, effort. But these are the kinds of activities, and that's what I'm basically driving at here, that establish the ambience of spiritual co uh, cooperation, concern, and support for each other. And this is how you build. It really is how you build a real church community. 
Church is more than just coming to church and seeing each other once, once a week. I hope that we do take the time to find out who's sick among us, who needs help, uh, maybe calling people to uh, find out how they're doing. You know, I try to do the best I can to keep up with updating prayers uh, and conditions of people who've asked for prayer. But you know what? If you're calling those same people that I'm calling and finding out as well some other tidbits or information, Hey, my email is bw at cgi.org, Bill W, Bill W at cgi.org, and you can go ahead and email me any updates because we post those updates on our CGI Medina website, and I, I mentioned that over the Internet. It's not bw, it's Bill W at cgi.org, and you can update me on any of the uh, conditions of those that we mentioned for special prayer because if there's anything that oftentimes falls by the wayside for those asking special prayer is the ongoing updates of how they're doing. And uh, as many of you have probably heard the story of, you know, well, I've been praying about so-and-so. What happened? Oh, he died two years ago, you know, and you didn't even know about it because nobody updated uh, you on the fact that he passed away or she passed away. So if indeed that happens, you can email me at billw at cgi.org, and we'll go ahead and post it on the cgimedina.org website. And for those of you who are interested in, because uh, I've had some calls with regard to Wayne Hendricks and his health and so on, you can also go ahead and just go to our cgimedina.org website, go into the special prayer request section, and find out updates that we do the best we can to keep updated, and you can uh, find out uh, what's happening with certain individuals if indeed you heard us request those special prayers from, from this particular area. But we need to learn. The point is we need to learn to be sensitive uh, toward each other. And Philippians, in the book of Philippians, and I want to bring this to your attention as well, the Apostle Paul continues this theme in adding to the fact that we should be committed to doing goodness, we should be committed to doing selflessness things for each other and ourselves, of course, uh, he also adds a bit uh, to the element of sensitivity. Here in chapter 2, the book of Philippians, and in verse 1, he states this, If there uh, be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, uh, and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm eager to serve and I will serve and I will sacrifice and I will take care of you and you and you and you because guess what? I want you to applaud for me. I, I, want, you, I want to develop the, re, re, uh, the reputation so that you, know, you all look up to me because see, I'm all doing it for me and my reputation because that's what it's all about. See, I'm serving because I want to be the, the big honcho, you know, the big kahuna. No, we don't do that. What Paul is saying, if anything, do it secretly. Do it on the side. You don't have to be uh, you know, out there in the forefront saying, hey, you know, I called so-and-so. Oh, I went and visited so-and-so. Yeah, you know. There are times when I get calls saying, hey, you know what? You haven't called so-and-so. I, I, they, they tell me I haven't called so-and-so for a while. She wants to talk to you or he wants to talk to you. I say, oh, okay, I'll call, <laughs> you know, because I'm doing things too. And sometimes I, you know, my lifestyle, just like your lifestyle, gets away from you from time to time. And lo and behold, you realize, oh, boy, I haven't called them in a long time, you know. So it is important that we do take that time and do the best we can to make those contacts, especially for those uh, who have needs. He goes on here in verse 3 of chapter 2, book of Philippians. Chapter 2, verse 3, But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Whoa. Now that's a challenge. Stop and let that resonate with us. Let you husbands think about that toward your wives, that they are more important. He says here, let each esteem other better than yourself and compare your actions toward your mates, whether it be your husband or your wife. Are you doing that? Are you esteeming them better than yourself, or are you treating them disrespectfully? Are you treating them like dirt? Are you throwing them under the bus all the time? It's important, very important, that we understand what these words mean and then how to apply them so they translate into actual, substantial, legitimate, intrinsic 
behavioral changes. They need to manifest differently from our personalities because, brethren, you are being called to become kings and priests. You know, sometimes I think we forget about that. You're going to be given a spirit body at some point when Christ returns, and if you're successful in navigating this life, you're going to be converted to the final, ultimate fashion, and that is as a spirit being. With that comes many, many additional powers, powers that come with, with that embodiment. And with that being said, there's a big responsibility. And part of that responsibility is going to be re-educating, treating, managing, guiding, directing human beings into a whole different lifestyle that's based off of this Bible. And that's real. That is real. I, I can't emphasize that more. I mean, I could scream and, you know, get real uh, exercised up here. But the fact of it is I shouldn't need to. Because my words, whether I emphasize them with a, lar a louder volume or whether I just mention them to you, the fact remains is that it doesn't change. The fact is you are being groomed to become kings and priests in the world tomorrow. And that comes with a big responsibility. And if you think that you're going to be given that kind of responsibility when you have a cynical, unforgiving, embittered, grudge-holding, you know, angry, uh, and all the things that go along with attitudes like that, brethren, I'll tell you what, you're going to miss out on that job application. <laughs> you're not going to get hired because what God is saying is that doesn't make, make it for getting the job that we are building in the corporation or in essentially his family that he is uh, building. So he continues here in, in verse 4, and as I wrap this up here in this section of Philippians chapter 2, he says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And again, we're challenged time after time. I mean, the Christian way of life is not an easy way of life if you are engaged in its demands, if you really are engaged in its demands and doing what basically uh, the Bible tells us to be doing through the many voices of these individuals that are, in fact, uh, written here in the Bible for us to be edified by. In James chapter 1, over here along the same lines, verse 22, look at the equivalency of what the Apostle James uses here to illustrate what true religion is. It's not understanding the fact that Christmas is pagan. Oh, that's part of it, I suppose you could say. You know, it's, it's not about understanding that there's no heaven or hell. Yeah, that's part of it too, the doctrines of God. And don't let me uh, marginalize them. They are very important. But when push comes to shove, what God is looking for is how is that information changing your personality? If that information, this truth that you've come in contact with and that he's revealed to you in your life is not actually converting you from A to Z, then you're missing the boat. And what really is underscoring the value of the knowledge that you have. So it's important here, as James equivocates this situation, he states this, and in verse 22 mentions, Be you doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Okay, right off the bat, he's setting the stage right here. That's the SPS, specific purpose statement of the remaining portion of this chapter. And he's going to take us now through this scenario, guiding us through uh, this uh, bit of information by this narrative that is written here. He says, Be you doers of the word, not just hearers, for if any be a hearer, notice the imagery, of the word, and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholds himself and goes his way and straight away forgets what manner of man he was. So soon we forget. You've heard of that term? So soon we forget. In other words, you've got to keep Christ 
in view all the time. What would Jesus do in this moment? You view life through the paradigm of the love of Christ, Christ crucified in you. What does Christ stand for? Because what Christ stands for, you stand for. Therefore, what are you doing? Are you doing something Christ stands for? Could Christ support you in what you're doing and how you're thinking and how you're talking, the tone of voice you're using? Could Christ support that? Would he say, good job, Bill. Yeah, keep at it. Keep at it, boy. Keep at it. You're doing good. You're doing good. Or would he say, <gasps> and be embarrassed of you? Be ashamed of you? Bow his head and say, you're on your own. <laughs> you know, We've got to be careful about that. What he's saying here is, look, don't forget the kind of person you are. When you look into this mirror, brother, the mirror being God's word, and you close the book to go to work, or you close the book to spend time with your family, or you close the book and go do your chores, or you close the book and you go visit a friend or a neighbor, or go to school or go to work, do you forget what you're seeing in the mirror of God's Word? I hope not. And that's the discipline. That's the discipline we all strive for because the fact of it is, we do. We do from time to time. We forget. But hopefully as time goes on, we forget less and less and we stay connected to the rails more perfectly as time goes on. He says here, Whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty, and that's what we're talking about, the Bible, the perfect law of liberty, and continues therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed, or like in my margin, this man will be blessed in his doing. He'll be blessed in his doing. That's how you get real life experiences, by getting out of the book, out of the, out of the theory of reading, studying, thinking, and into the real world where you then start actually engaging what you've been studying and reading and beginning to put life behind the Word. And then manifesting these characteristics, you, guess what? You become the recipient of blessings because this Word, if it indeed is engaged and enacted in your life, you will be reciprocated with blessings in your life. Without a doubt, you will. He goes on here and he says, If any man among you seems to be religious, now here comes the equivocation, and bridles not his tongue, he deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion, here it is, undefiled before God and the Father, is this. Visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. Visit those who are less fortunate, lonely, brokenhearted, and need and would love to be encouraged by time being spent with those that they maybe formerly had one time had opportunity to share their life with and time with, as well as stay clean in a dirty world. And that is a challenge as well, staying clean in a very dirty world. I've got a lot of other scriptures I wanted to share with you. Time has run out on me. But all I can say, brethren, is that we are challenged, and yet God is using those challenges to prepare us for rebuilding a whole new social order. That's real. That's something that all of us need to understand. You're not going to be going to be for all eternity viewing a beatific vision, sitting on a cloud and or eating angel food cake. That, that's not the promise of the saved. The promise of the saved is going to be a very active life. Christ landing on the earth, you know the story, you know the prophecies. So many times we've heard them over and over, and we'll be hearing them more as we go into the fall holy days of the Feast of Trumpets and Atonement and Tabernacles in the last day. And the fact of it is, those are real events in this book of liberty, this mirror of our soul, that are indeed going to occur. 
And when he comes back, the objective, at least I hope our objective is, is that we will meet him in the air, one way or the other. If we're alive, we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, is what your Bible says. And or, if you were indeed dead, that you will be raised first and come blasting through wherever you're come blasting through from and changed into a spirit being, meeting him in the air where you shall be with him. And where is he going? He's landing on the Mount of Olives. He's not staying in the clouds. He's not staying in the air. He's going to land. He's going to set up world ruling government in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to become the capital of the world. And you and me, I hope, are going to be ones that are going to be dispersed from that particular location to rebuild a whole new social order. And you often will be the city, the figurative city, symbolically you as a human being. When you go out to go and get those who are left from all of the distress and the uh, destruction that occurred during those times of plagues, trumpets, and vials, and so forth, you are going to be, needless to say, the example, the example that these individuals are going to look to. What are they going to see? What kind of personality are they going to find in you if you are out there, maybe with another buddy, because Christ always sends them out there two by two, <laughs> so maybe you'll have a, a work buddy with you. Point being, how are you going to be viewed by those that are just in shock, they're in disarray, they're disoriented? How will you be? Will you be tender, engaging, or will you say, stand up, get out of here, get in line, We're gonna get all you people over here. You know. <laughs> how are we going to be? Your Bible says, be tender hearted. So are we facing up to the task at hand? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Are we facing up to the task at hand? Are we progressing? Are we really progressing toward a new personality? If you can't look back and say, you know what, I've changed. I'm not that same person I was years ago. Not just because of the knowledge you have. I understand. I get that. Yeah, you've got, you know a lot of truth. You know a lot of understanding. You, you know a lot of how, uh, you know, Hellenism encroached on our religion, the Christian religion. You know, you know a lot of the things about the Catholic Church and all these things that we understand about the truth of God and, and so forth, the resurrection, the, uh, the reward of the saved and what have you. That's all great and dandy. But again, if it is not translating you into a different personality... All of that is just vanity, quite frankly. So you know something others don't. Big deal. God wants that knowledge to be parlayed into something totally different so that you become a new personality. So the question is, are we really progressing toward a new personality? And part of that citing manifestation is this. We're always told it in the ministry. Are you easy to entreat and are you willing and cooperative and happy to serve? We're always told in the ministry, we're reminded, you are the servants of the people, you know, you're the bottom of the pyramid. We're not the top anymore, we're at the bottom. <laughs> in the CGI, we're the inverted pyramid. You know, the ministry facilitates the people. We, we do the best we can to support the people in hopes to educate you to become independent critical thinkers not codependent on the ministry where we are telling you what color of drapes to buy in your house or what type of car you need to buy and all of that. No, that, that, those days don't exist. What exists now is you need to critically think. You need to make up your own minds. You need to make the decisions because guess what? You're going to stand before Christ and you're going to be held responsible and accountable for what you did do and or what you did not do. And so it's very, very important, brother. We ask ourselves, do people find it easy to talk to us? Do we find ourselves with people coming to us, you know, and, and uh, we're friendly? And, and yes, I'm, I'm dedicated to serve. I, I'm willing to serve. I'm willing to do anything as long as I can, you know, participate in my level. I, I don't want to do things that are outside of my scope because I only make a fool out of myself and maybe I'll get us in trouble, <laughs> you know, and I don't want to do that. But point, and that's good. That's wisdom. That's prudence and certainly uh, um, something noble that all of us could uh, learn from. But the point is, is it 
and are we dedicated to service and easy to entreat? Are we really, here's another one, are we really caring for those God has called to our congregation? We can deflect and dis, uh, dissipate responsibility in many ways by expanding our, oh yeah, I care about the world. You know, I, I care about all those people in India. I care about all the third world country. And that kind of deflects and takes the pressure off of us in obligating and or dedicating our services and or our personalities and lifestyles toward one another close at home. But that's the question. Do we really care? And are we really doing the best we can to take care of the people that we meet with in the congregation that uh, we par uh, participate in? And are we practicing these two items? Consideration and courtesy. Committed to a spirit of unity in the bond of peace. Because if we're not, brethren, if we're not, we are cruising for a bruising. So my hope is that I hope we are indeed doing the best we can to fulfill these objectives and answer these questions.